Hello and welcome to our program, Violence Free World. My name is Kali Igwe. Um, today we continue our journey, or we continue on the road to a violence-free Nigeria. And my guest on the program today is Mr. Solomon Arase, the chairman of the Police Service Commission and former Inspector General of the Nigerian Police for the Republic of Nigeria. Mr. Arase, you're welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Okay, we're going to delve straight back into the conversation, but first we're going to take this special report. Hang on, we'll be right back. There is a man of speaking that threatens, provoke, and intimidate. It is referred to in some quarters as rhetoric of fury. Certain individuals vexed on some issues sometimes resort to this manner of expression to vent frustration with a view to drawing attention to their plight and ultimately getting justice. It is a universal phenomenon that has generated tension in many societies and in most cases, rather than resolve, has worsened matters. Rhetorical theory has led nations to war, pitch partners irreversibly against each other, divided nations, and obliterated multinational corporations. It is a proven recipe for disaster and a last resort that hints at the limitation of man's capacity to resolve sensitive issues. Tense moments in the course of Nigeria's journey through nationhood can be largely attributed to tough stances and uncompromising remarks by various opinion leaders. The Nigerian Civil War of 1966, where the tirades between Colonel Odimego Ojuku and General Yakubo Gawan went overboard is about the most tragic of all similar incidents. Unfortunately too, the pre-election exchanges between both candidates, Akin Omoboreu and Governor Adekunle Ajasin, also led to serious bloodletting in the aftermath of the 1983 governorship elections in Ondo State. Also, the 1993 June 12 elections and the subsequent annulment had in tow an uncompromising stance for the presumed winner M.K. Abiola and a counter-attitude by then Head of State General Sani Abacha that eventually left Nigeria in a dire strait. The concerns, therefore, that follow recent tough exchanges between political actors in the mode of Faisal Skiamu versus Dele Momodu, Governor Samuel Otom versus former Vice President Atiku Abubakar and Femi Fani Kayaru versus Dine Malaya are understandable. Finally, preserving Nigeria's sovereignty and keeping the country violence free require the constructive deployment of dialogue as against tough stances via pronouncement that speaks more to sentiments and ego rather than reason. Welcome back. This is Violence Free World. Mr. Rasse, let's go straight into the conversation. Your recent appointment as the chairman of the Police Service Commission seemed to have brought you straight back into uh, the issues of security in Nigeria. And again, we're at a threshold. We're going into an election. The nation is transiting from one democratic um, era to another seamlessly like it had happened in the past. Suddenly, we're having issues, a lot of issues, that seem to threaten the very basis of our existence. 
how worried are you that all of this is happening at this moment and just now that you're coming in? Thank you very much, Kali. Um, our elections through the years, you know, from the first uh, republic uh, to the new uh, democratic experience we've had since 1999, the issues have always been the same. You know, there's always this palpable fear uh, whenever we are going to have elections. And uh, elections are segmented into three phases. Uh, one, before the elections, the phase we are now, where people have to campaign, traverse across the length and breadth of the country. Uh, sometimes they say things that could hurt the other opponents, that could cause, you know, uh, some disquiet uh, in the system. Uh, then the second phase is when the election proper will come. Then the last phase is when the results, they start ruling in. And uh, it's, it's always been like that. But uh, I, my own take is that it's a phase. And uh, we, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't be scared. Uh, the elections will, be, will come and go. And, uh, uh, you know, Nigerians will, will have their lives back. Um, I, I, I don't envisage any, you know, any violence as it, as it, as it were. Uh, it, it has always been like that. If you watch, you know, most of our elections, there's what you usually call what most of the security people they do before the elections. They call it uh, political intelligence, where you, you know, you monitor the trends and patterns of, you know, political campaigns uh, across, you know, the six geopolitical zone to be able to actually gauge, you know, what are those, what are those issues those central fungal forces, you know, that, that, you know, tends to, you know, tear us apart. Um, but when the elections come, it, it is always usually seamless. And uh, that has always been the pattern. And though there will be pockets of violence here and there, but um, I don't env envisage that um, it's going to be something that, you know, will threaten the very foundation of our existence. Existence. Okay. The tension around the elections are perhaps worsened by the prevalence of a culture of terrorism in the form of banditry kidnapping. I recall that where you were uh, the police commissioner at Akwaibom, you had um, worked on um, a framework, on um, a, a kind of protocol that catered to uh, kidnapping, particularly. Now, from your observations, while you were out of power, I mean, where you were away from government, can you see us still being on that path to which you had... Uh, Prescribe. I know you did that, that you know, went on to become the Inspector General of Police, meaning that there was an opportunity for that to be strengthened or to be consolidated, which would have happened, and it is a system, as it were. Has it been reversed? Do you see that still helping us? What are you observing? Uh, well, you, you see, the, 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 the problem with governance in this country is that uh, there are no sustainability of policies both at the, you know, the federal and the sub-national levels. So you, come, you see everybody who comes up, who, who, you know, who is thrown into power, you start coming up with different um, you know, policies and where you are trying to leave the other ones alone. Dealing with issues of internal security disorder was very, very easy for me. I, my own approach was that you cannot deal with issues of crime and criminality with the limited number of police officers that we have. The total strength of all our security forces in the country is about 700 and something. If you put the army, put the Air Force, put the Navy, put the Nigerian police, put the DSS, everybody together, we are, we are less than, we are about 700 and something. Less than a million. Yes, which means that, you know, uh, it, is, it will be practically impossible for you. Policing is about two fundamental things visibility and dominance of the security space. Those two things are very, very critical. And uh, you alluded to Aquaibom. Aquaibom, you know, was, uh, was almost going into, was becoming a Hobbesian state where, where, where might was right. Everybody was uh, scared. They were even kidnapping people in, uh, in churches. And uh, the strategy was very, very easy. Can we win the hearts and minds of the people? As you know, you now rely on community partnership in dealing with issues of internal security. Can you now put that side by side 
with you know police visibility by having you know um, man material mix where you have all, it, it was very easy in Aquaibom because Aquaibom if you see the way Aquaibom is located so if you deploy your assets you know uh, at strategic locations anybody who is coming into the town will know that you know before you do anything <laughs> you know uh, it may not take time for you to be arrested and no no criminal wants to be arrested anyway you want to commit crime and run away but when you know that um, the, the structure that in, in, on ground is such that if you commit a crime, you know, the, the, you know there are going to be consequences. It's, it's, a, it's a form of deterrent. And uh, when I became the Inspector General of Police, I came from an intelligence background. I was the head of the Intelligence uh, Bureau. And my own thing was very, very simple, that in every part of the world that, you have, that I've been to, it is intelligence that drives police operations. So we're talking about trends and patterns of crime. So with trends and patterns of crime, you can crime map a country. So you know what are the prevalent you know, crimes in the various geopolitical zone. And that will assist you in deploying your assets you know, to deal with those issues. In any country that abandons intelligence in dealing with internal security, you know, can never succeed. I always give example of the United Kingdom and, and, and Wales. Across those, that space, you have close to about 5 million CCTV cameras, you know, dotted all over the place. So you cannot traverse anywhere in the United Kingdom, you know, twice without you being captured you know, being put, pulled into their systems. And how many men do they have? It is not the physical security that we're talking about. We are talking about also in introducing technology into dealing with issues of internal security disorders. And that is what other countries have done. And I think that is one area where we think we should be looking at, you know, uh, going forward to deal with these issues of uh, internal security disorders. Well, well, that relates, that brings me to the question I was even going to ask. You've even answered them. We, we, a lot of people think that the issues of security as we're experiencing presently uh, is more due to the lack of political will to attend to this rather than the capacity in form of uh, mat material and uh, even technology. Because you know about this. You probably even tried to put it, uh, to practicalize it while you were at the Kwaibom and when you became Inspector General of Police. We are not so poor not to be able to afford all of this. You, you, you're doing checks. People pass, how many people can you physically check? You understand, it becomes a random issue most of the times. So this political will thing, how long can we keep dealing with this? When, when it's, can we say enough is enough? Well, um, that, is a very <laughs> that is a very good question. And my answer to that is that, you know, we've had about three police reforms since 1999. The first was under Damadami, the second was under MD Yusuf, and the third was uh, DIG Pario and and Clean Foundation. Clean Foundation also did something too. The issues that we're talking about when it comes to issues of crime and criminality, they are, they are, they are virtually the same. You know, how do you deal with these issues? You know, how do you have public trusts restored? How do you bring in public partnership into dealing with uh, issues of security? How? Do you ensure that training and retraining to sharpen the capacities of the policemen you have is, uh, is such? The whole thing, they are, they, are, they are there in the public domain, but uh, I will agree with you that we've not been able to really harness them, you know, into uh, addressing the issues. That is where the political will comes in from. The Damadami report actually came out with a white paper. And uh, I was the secretary of that committee. We went to, we were in Canada, we were in the United, uh, the United Kingdom, trying to see what are the best practices, 
you know, that are obtainable in other jurisdictions. What are those things we can learn from other jurisdictions? And when it came out, um, Professor Alemeka, the renowned sociologist, was also a member of that committee. We, did, we now sat down when the white paper was released, and we now said, okay, can we break this thing down into some implementation you know, strategies to say what are the short-term things that uh, uh, you, we can harvest, low-hanging fruits that we can harvest without financial implications? What are the mid-term things that we can do? What are the long-term things that we can do? And uh, you, 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 there are multiplicity of oversight functions you know, that are competing for the soul of internal security in Nigeria. The ministry is there. The you know, oversight bodies are there, the Police Service Commission, the National Assembly, Senate, Committee on Police Affairs. So you see, when you have you know, this multiplicity of uh, groups overseeing a particular department, sometimes there are always what you call a policy overlaps. Okay, now one other issue. Um, the security situation in the southeast is beginning to look like um, the Boko Haram in its uh, infancy days. And somehow it was allowed to fester, then it turned into the monster that it is today. Some persons will say uh, maybe persons is just agitating. Do you suspect that is this about agitation or pure criminality and business has gone into it, just like it's happening in the Northwest? It's, uh, it's really sad. The Southeast is the hub of the economic, um, you know, life way of the country. So if you, if you now have uh, a, a group of, you know, young men uh, now saying that uh, they are shutting down, the, you know, the commercial uh, base of a country, uh, it could be very, very sad. You could also look at it from issues of identity crisis. Uh, people want, want to, you know, people will see it, uh, you know, some scholars, they will see it, they will say, oh, these people are agitating for space. But when you agitate for space, there are ways you go about it. You know, so I think that is um, the issue that is becoming very worrisome. You know, we're thinking that um, they were calling for attention. But in calling for attention, you know, the collateral damage that you are doing to, you know, your own people, you know, um, so you, 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 don't, um, you don't always apply excessive force in dealing with issues like that all the time. Okay, going forward, there have been developments that touched on um, the reform to which we were very, very much to set out, the constitutional issues, structural issues, but we're going to come back and... Um, touch on all of us, speak to some of those issues. But that will be when we'll return from this break. This is Violent Free World. We'll be right back after this break. Don't go away. Welcome back. This is Violence Free World. I'm still here with Mr. Solomon Arasi, Chairman of the Police Service Commission and former Inspector General of Police. Mr. Arasi, just before we went to break, we are touching on um, developments that are beginning to uh, hint at reforms, constitutional um, uh, status, and all of that. There's something going on in the Southeast presently now where there's a, uh, there's a day that is called sit at home day. But I don't know, why, why, why are we allowing this to, is it not like a kind of like an endorsement of these things? Well, you see, when, when people become excessive in uh, conducts like that, there's always a pushback. On Monday, um, I think in Ogidi also, 
you know, they were, the, the, the people came together. They said there were some enforcers who were trying to enforce that sit-at-home uh, policy. And the people said, no, you cannot, you cannot do that. And they fought back. You know, so you see, it, it, it gets to a stage when you get to in the, in, the, in, the, in the life of a country where you say, no, such deviant behaviors should not be tolerated. And the people will, on their own, you know, take responsibility for making sure that they deal with such, um, you know, uh, mis mis uh, miscreants or whatever they are. And uh, we are we are actually getting there. When I read uh, what happened in Ogidi on Monday, you know, it was a bit relieving because um, if you even watch our, our law enforcement uh, organizations, they are overstretched. You know, the military is virtually in about 32, <laughs> 32 states in the federation. Uh, then you come and think about uh, them being in the front lines. Then you see the police too. Um, they, are, they are thinking about managing an elections. They are also thinking about managing crime. So you see, uh, it's taking a lot of toll on them. And even their mental health sometimes, you know, <laughs> is something that uh, we have not, uh, we are not looking at. But there, there has also been this um, practice or this culture that is now fast spreading, if it's not virtually in all the states of the Federation, there are security outfits uh, like the Ebuwegu, Amotekun, everywhere now. Is, does it strike you like this is a precursor to this much agitated state police for which time it seemed like had come, which closely relates to the reforms that we're talking about and the constitutional issues too. How do you situate this? Well, um, the, the, my, my, my response to that your question would be, how were our you know, um, traditional communities, how were they policed before we had you know, former policing system? They were, they were policed. So, Vigilante star. Yes. And that is why, you know, the, the age groups in those days, they protect markets, they protect roads. You know, they were they were they were a semblance of, you know, policing in our traditional African society. And that they were in the you know, the uh, Emir's palace, the Oba's palace and all those type of thing. The missing link is that we have not been able to marry the traditional policing system with our modern policing system. And we should? Oh, we should, you know. Policing is local. I, maybe in your community in those days, nobody can come in, can drive into your community without somebody, you know, knowing that a stranger has come in there. So which means that everybody, all of us, in those various communities, we were very, very active and even in you know, the traditional, um, the, the old um, uh, British uh, <laughs> Empire. That is how policing started. So if we now start having this multiplicity, you know, of security, these things, while they are good, they should be subsumed under the policing system that's the original policing system we have. Okay, uh, uh, we're just looking at desperate situations. They say sometimes calls for desperate measures. Desperate measures, one time the governor of Benin State and even Taraba State had called for people to be allowed to bear arms. Since the federal government uh, seemed like um, not being able to, 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 to provide for everyone, to protect everyone, and that became quite controversial. People have been talking about it. I'd like you to speak to this issue too. Yes, you know, the, you know, desperation, just as you, just as you have said, you know, can lead you to taking. That is why I said, we must sit together as a, as a people and say what national security architecture we want to have in place. You, you get what I'm saying. Yes. So if there is this, you know, uh, synergy between the subnational and the national. Some of these, you know, the governors, okay, it, let me, let me, let me, let me also tell you too that the, uh, the Security Council, the National Security Council, they usually meet, you know, 
intermittently, especially when they want to appoint an IG. Uh, it's in the constitution. All the governors are members. The IG is member. Chairman Police Service Commission is member. Maybe if they have a way of convoking that one at least every quarter, so that the the um, the various governors will have a sense of belonging. They can always ventilate their their worries, you know, in such you know a forum. Uh, and maybe it will ameliorate what, what uh, we're talking about. Just your word of advice as we go to young people, especially looking to violence as um, a way out, especially when they see people who get involved with this, sometimes getting rewarded instead of being punished. There must be consequences for crime. Yes, so your word of advice uh, to these yes, young people. I, I will want to appeal to the young ones out there that, um, you see, when, when you allow yourself to be used to, for the actualization of other people's dreams in such a negative way, uh, you are doing a very big disservice to yourself and to the country. Violence is not a panacea to you know, problems. There are, all of us will have problems, <laughs> yeah, you know, and uh, we all try to struggle to make sure that you know, we, we are able to eke out a living. So I want to appeal to all the young men there uh, whenever these guys they call you out to come and you know become destructive, you should also think that they have most of their children in the Ivy League schools, you know, who are out there, you know, doing their own thing too. So don't uh, don't allow yourself to be used. Uh, there's always many tomorrows. All right, Mr. Rice, I think that's a very good point to leave it at this point of us. Thank you very much you, for for obliging me. All right, I have been speaking with Mr. Solomon Arasi, the chairman of the Police Service Commission and the former Inspector General of Police, the Federal Republic of Nigeria. That's been our offering today, same time next week. Promises much more if you endeavor to be here. Until then, please remember to remain on the road to a violence-free Nigeria. Once again, thank you for watching.